Today we're very fortunate to have another of America's heroes to come and share some of the experiences with us. We have Mr. Jim Swartz. Jim, we appreciate you coming and we'd love to hear what you have to tell us. Well, first of all, Ozzy, thank you for having me and I just want to tell everybody that uh, Alex Davis is probably the most patriotic human being in Lauderdale County. Thank you, Jim. You can find someone else more patriotic than Alzie, you let me know. We'll uh, make him number two. Uh, my career started in the military in uh, April of 1967. Uh, I went to basic training at Fort Benning, Georgia. Uh, I was convinced that their basic training at uh, Fort Benning to also go to jump school there. So after graduating uh, jump school, then they convinced me uh, to go to Special Forces. Where then I went to uh, four months of intense training at Fort Bragg. And everybody knew when you left Special Forces school, you were only going to go one place. So I left in uh, late 67, arrived in Vietnam, and stayed there until late 1970, where I then rotated back. Uh, they were moving Special Forces people around, getting special training in other areas. And our team went to uh, Rhodesia for a while. And then we left Rhodesia, and then we went to Israel for a while, where we got some more additional training. And after almost four and a half years, I finally got to see uh, United States again. And from there I traveled around and then was assigned to Fort Gordon, Georgia, where I was uh, taken uh, and sent to military police school. And then after a stateside incident, uh, I was taken off jump status, so therefore I couldn't remain in special forces, so I became a military policeman. And I traveled out to Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, spent a few years there, then transferred out to uh, Okinawa, Japan, which uh, that was a, another experience because I got in Jap Okinawa at the time that the U.S. was changing everything over to the Japanese, and uh, I learned a lot about riot control, and uh, not so much as me on riot control as my Japanese police partner, and uh, it was just funny to see these small little people with the, all the padding and everything on, going out and fighting in the crowd, just just taking care of the situation, but they were very good at their jobs. And uh, then they closed down the facility and moved the Armed Forces Police out of there. And instead of coming back to the States, I was sent to Korea, where I pulled 13 months in Korea, which was a totally brand new experience. You can never wear enough clothing in Korea in the wintertime. It just makes its way through your club. And uh, came back to the States, Fort Knox, Kentucky. Uh, spent some time there and then there was an overage in the military police corps so I was transferred into Army Air Defense where then I went to Fort Hood, Texas then to Germany for five years. Traveled a lot in Germany. When Don't ever say these guys go to these foreign countries, well oh, there's nothing to do. Well, I traveled all through Europe. And there's a lot of great places there. And when I got back to the States, uh, they assigned me to Fort Bliss, Texas, where I spent eight years. I would call up my branch and say, uh, when am I being rotated? And they would give me the answer, you haven't bought a house yet? Because <laughs> they was telling me I was going to be there for a while. And uh, 1992, I, rotated, I retired from the Army, moved back here, and was uh, Lucky enough to get a job out at the Naval Air Station and worked out there for 10 years with the T2 uh, Buckeye until it retired, and then they retired me from there. Give, give us a little insight into Special Forces, Jim. What, what kind of training it did? did can you share with us what you all did? Special Forces is given the wrong concept. The, the concept of Special Forces, the original concept, was to be an advisor. You go into a village, you train the people. Uh, to defend themselves, also to build things, dig wells and things like that. You organize them to, to be their self. You know, a lot of the things you see on TV where special forces are going behind the lines and doing all these special op missions, uh, there's some of that, but the main majority of them, like in Iraq and Afghanistan, they were going out to the, to the villages, trying to get the villages to, you know, form their own own defense groups mm -hmm. 
and you train them in the, how to use the weapons you train them with and, and stuff like that and, and you just train them. Yeah, I went on a few clandestine missions while I was in Vietnam when they pulled us off or when they would send my whole team, 12 man and 600 plus mountain yards to go out and maybe do an ambush or, or attack a unknown uh, North Vietnamese or Viet Cong camp. Did you ever have to jump out over parachute over Vietnam? I have, there were only like 19 or 20 actual combat jumps in Vietnam and I managed to get on three. What did, what did that feel like, Jim? I mean, here you Jumping, are, but well, it's, just, it's, it's, it's nighttime? Or? It's, it's, yeah, most jumps were at night and it wasn't like it was during the D-Day invasion, you know, where those guys were getting shot at all the time. It was, it was a well-picked drop zone, and you went in there, you got rid of your gear, and then you went and did your mission. Uh, so it, it's a little different. It's similar to the one that happened in Iraq when they first went in. The 173rd uh, Airborne Brigade jumped in the northern part of Iraq because the, the, the Turkish government wouldn't allow them to bring in vehicles and that from the north. So to get a force up north with a curve threat, they jumped to 173rd. There hasn't been a well, I take it back. Uh, when they jumped into Panama and they jumped into Grenada, uh, they had some incidents, especially in Panama, where they had several uh, soldiers were hit. And one soldier was wounded uh, in Panama, and they tried to keep him on the airplane, but he wanted to keep, so he went out the door, wounded. And uh, you, you have incidents like that. I probably would have been very scared if I knew someone was on the ground and actually could see me or knew I was coming down and firing at me because you don't really have a way to defend yourself because your gear is still affixed to you. Well, how did, how do you know, Jim, what you was going to land when you jumped? At night? You, did, was it open area or was it wooded? Jungle well, they were mostly, they were, they were, they were, most times you knew you were going into an open area, but you always had the fear of drifting into to bushes or if they had to go in before that and, and blow a drop zone, you had the, the trees that were blowing up that were falling over. You always had a chance. I, I in my 26 years, in my 1,302 jumps, I've broken both my ankles three times. Because you either hit wrong or you hit something on the ground. And then you always had a fear if you were doing a night jump or a day jump, uh, if you got a moon, sometimes a road looks like a stream because of the, the glare coming off of it. So you think, well, okay, I'm going in the water, and the next thing you know, you're landing on an asphalt road. But pretty much the drop zones are marked, and you pretty much know where you're going unless you get a, a sudden gust of wind or something like that at the last minute, which takes you off, and you try to you correct yourself. The new parachutes nowadays the, are more, they're easier to, to maneuver where you're going and stuff like that. It's more like a parasail than it is a parachute. What was a jump, the height that you all would jump from most of the time? Well, you have different, if, if you were going to do a quick jump, it was between 1,000 and 750 feet. It was going to be a more accurate, long jump, you jump from 12,500, where you would be traveling a little bit of distance and it would be more pinpoint drop. The thing you have to remember in, in airborne is, if it's cold, you're going to hit the ground fast. If it's hot, you're going to have a lot of hang time. What is that, Jim? It's the heat and the, the coming up off the ground, which which will hold you up, you know, like like a heat thermal, like gliders like to do, and people who parasail. And if it's cold, you don't have that heat, and it just brings you down. Well, how fast are you coming down? Let's say in cold weather, miles per hour, would you say? On a parachute, oh, probably. Uh, 15 to 20 miles an hour. It seems faster, but it's, it's not any faster than that. Oh. So when you broke your ankles, what happened? You just landed wrong? Yeah, just landed wrong or hit something that was on the ground that you didn't okay. see. Most of my jumps, well, my, my jumps in Vietnam were all night jumps. So you can't really see what's on the ground. That was before night vision got over. So you, you, you wasn't wearing night vision where you could see what you were, you were coming up. And you had your weapons with you when you jumped. Mm -hmm. Yep. Did, was there any special honors or medals or anything that you received by being wounded, by breaking your ankles? 
Well, I received two bronze stars in Vietnam, one for Valor, three Purple Hearts, and then again in Desert Storm, I received a Silver Star and another bronze star there. Would you explain those stars to you? Okay, the Silver Star is the, there's two medals higher than that, it's the third highest award you can get in combat. Uh, the Bronze Star is the next one below that's just, you know, they, they read, see what you did and figure out whether you're going to get a Silver Star, Bronze Star, Congressional Medal of Honor. I also have two Legion of Merits and two Meritorious Servicemen below that, and I have the Air Medal. Okay. Yes, I guess you'd like to share with us. I just want to share that the military is not for everybody, but everybody should have a chance and, and try it. Uh, combat is not for everybody. Uh, it's like going into Iraq. Uh, we weren't expecting IEDs. You know, it was just something we had never dealt with before. And then when we got there, that was something that came up. And nowadays, the military makes it technically more safer for people in the military than back when I was in the military. Okay. It just gets better as, as it goes along. Jim, I want you to know how much we appreciate your service in you. this country. Another America's true hero, Mr. Jim Swartz. Today we'll have another of America's heroes to come share with us his experiences while he was protecting this country. We have Mr. Jim Schwartz. Mr. Jim, welcome aboard and we look forward to you sharing with us your experiences when you served this country. Thank you. Um, I'm a Vietnam veteran, also a Desert Storm veteran. In Vietnam I served with the 5th Special Forces as an advisor and trainer with the uh, South Vietnamese government and also with a group of civilians called Mountain Yards, which is a tribal group of people from the, the mountainous areas of Vietnam. And our job was to go into the villages and organize and train them into fighting units to protect not only their village, but to go out and help the American forces track down and fight the uh, Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese regulars. Okay. And I served in Vietnam for three years. Um, collected a couple Purple Hearts and a couple other medals while I was there and served served a tough three-year tour with Special Forces. We didn't rotate out like normal units rotated out, even though some of the officers were rotated back to come back to the States and work as trainers and, and instructors, but uh, our particular unit stayed three years and uh, went through a lot of tough situations while we were there and saw a lot of stuff that sometimes you wish to forget. And, uh, it was just Jim, well, let's go back to your Purple Hearts. Give us a little explanation, a story about the, how you received those. Well, my first Purple Heart uh, I received uh, in an ambush, uh, which you think you know they're there, but they're, they are there, but you don't know it. And, uh, I received a uh, Purple Heart. I was shot in the thigh. It was my first Purple Heart. Uh, my second Purple Heart, I received shrapnel in my right shoulder. And the third Purple Heart was uh, to some injuries to my feet. When you received that first wound, or shot, what was you thinking? What, what, just what come over you, Jim? Well, at first, I didn't even know I'd been hit because... Everything that was going on, you're more or less trying to protect yourself and, and watch where the fire's coming from so you can return fire and that. And basically after the enemy pulled back and, and left from the ambush is when I discovered I was uh, I was hit. It was basically felt like a bee sting at first, and then eventually it got it began to hurt worse. Where did it take you then? We were medevac back to Da Nang. It was our closest... Uh, large base. We were working out of a place called Quan Tri, which is in the central part of the United, central part of the country in the north. Uh, we worked mainly in a place called the Ashaw Valley and another valley called the Elephant Valley, which was large concentrations of the Viet Cong. 
Uh, tell us about the shrapnel in the shoulder. Shrapnel in the shoulder was, uh, I had moved forward and, uh, I ran into about 40, uh, Viet Cong and, uh, I turned to go back to join forces and they threw a grenade that actually exploded prematurely. If it had hit the ground and exploded, it probably would have taken out my leg, but it exploded prematurely and not all the shrapnel separated from the hand grenade and hit me in the shoulder. I got about eight pieces in there. All right, what was the third one? Third one involved a, a little 16-day stay I had with the, the Viet Cong. My uh, special forces team was uh, on a mission to rescue three CIA pilots that had been shot down. And in the process, we were surrounded and ran out of ammunition, and at that time it was a better part of valor to surrender. And for 16 days, we went through considerable torture, and the injuries that I was inflicted was on the bottom of my feet, where they used a split bamboo pole and beat the bottom of my feet. And then on the 16th day, they had a torrential Monsoon come in, and we managed to, a couple of us managed to get our little cages poles so we could climb out, and we managed to escape and uh, bring out some other prisoners that was in the compound with us. Plus, we captured four of the camp personnel, and we returned back to friendly lines. But you, you were without a weapon, Jim. How did... Well, we managed, with special forces, you're trained to use Whatever. What you find. And once we, the two of us got out, we got some of the other fellows out, we managed to recover our weapons and, and gear that they had gotten there and, and, and escape. We spent 16 days and we returned back to our line. How often would they beat a hit on the bottom of your feet? With Every that? day. Can you describe the pain that was associated with that? It had gotten to the point that there was no pain. And that's why they would do it on a, on a daily basis, knowing that after a large period of time, you the pain would just, unless they were actually beating on you, that's when you, you felt the pain. But it just dulled. It was just deadening after a while. You know, you just, I got used to the pain. I have a high tolerance for pain right now. You know, I can get hurt or something like that, and it really takes a lot. Were they trying to get information out of you all, or were they just coaching well, you for the sake of it? Or Special forces all had a bounty on our heads. So we were in the process of waiting for transportation to go further north because to capture special forces would be like capture, capturing a general or something like that because we were the ones that were training and, and we were considered the elite. And that's why the... Tw Twelve of us were able to formulate a secret plan that we didn't even know about to get ourselves out of there because we, we weren't allowed to talk back and forth between the cages and stuff like that. and We just basically knew what we had to do to get out of there. Did you think that it was all over once they captured you, you surrendered, Jim? Well, I knew at that time we wouldn't be executed. I knew that if we made it north to... The northern prison camp like Hanoi Hilton and a couple others they had in the early stages of the war that there was a chance that unless we escaped prior to movement, I would have to either spend years in prison or be tortured and killed. And I wasn't about to let that happen. So the cages that you all were confined in were made out of bamboo? Bamboo with wire. And I guess after the period of time that had been in the jungle, some of the wire had gotten to the point where we could, you know, move it and break it and then conceal it so that the enemy wouldn't see where it was broken. And Jim, we have read, I have, and it heard that they would strap bombs on small children and run them up to the American soldiers. Did you see any of that? Is that? A lot of what I heard, I never saw any of it, was in the bigger cities, they had what they called uh, shoe, sign, shoe shine bombers, where a young kid would come up and, and ask to 
shine your shoe and he would either get away from it and then set off the booby trap that would set off the explosion or he would actually pop the grenade. Uh, as far as like they're doing now in the Middle East where you see huge bombs strapped on people, I didn't see much of that. Uh, I heard a lot about it. In the north, uh, some kid come rolling by on a bicycle would pitch a grenade and then keep on going. It wasn't so much that, I, you know, like the booby traps that was in the jungle was probably the biggest thing that we worried about. How did you all recognize the booby traps? Well, you get you get some pre-training. Uh, you move slow. You, you, you watch the ground. You have, some people will watch. The guys out front will watch the ground for the snares and the trip wires, while another guy will watch for the snipers and that in the tree, so you're working as a team. Uh, I guess the ones that were really hard to see would be the uh, the punji sticks, because it was they would weave um, the grass and it would cover a hole with bamboo spears or spikes as you want to call them, and then you would step there and believe it or not, the, they were so sharp that they would go through the bottom of your boot, and the Vietnamese would dip their Spikes in human waste, and that would cause further infection. How does did you heard in Desert Storm? Mm -hmm. How does it compare with? There have been three wars that have been fought unconventional. Korea, where we fought the Chinese, that was not like World War One, World War Two, where you have trench warfare or you knew where your enemy was. Okay, he's holding this town like in World War II. You had to go get him out of there. In Vietnam and Korea, you had to fight from hill to hill. You, you take a hill one day, and two days later you gave the hill up and went back, and then the next week you were back taking over the same hill. And in, in Desert Storm, we basically knew where, where Saddam Hussein had his forces because we had better reconnaissance. We knew that he had placed his lines and stuff like this, so... That was a little different war. Now we're fighting in Iraq, well, out of Iraq, but we're in Afghanistan. We're fighting that unconventional war again where the IEDs, uh, you know, bombers coming in and, and blowing up and stuff like that. That's unconventional. That's a terrorist or counterinsurgency type war. And you have to fight it different. You can't fight it like you can World War One, World War Two, and and the Desert Storm because you don't know who your enemy is. Like Vietnam, yeah, you could see the, the pretty girl with the pretty dress on and stuff like that, and she'd come up smiling and, like I said, pitch a grenade or, or something like that or, you know, other means of, of doing it. And they were forced to do that in, in, in Vietnam unless they were really dedicated Viet Cong or communist. And that's what we're dealing with now in, in Afghanistan. These are really diehard Taliban and... and uh, Al Qaeda and, and things like that. They just think that we are the total bad guys. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of people don't understand this. You know, they, oh, but we're losing so many young men and women. Well, if you want to look at it that way, you lose more men and women, teenagers in America to auto accidents every year than you have totally in both Iraq and Afghanistan. So if you, if you want to look at it technically, you're safer to go to war in Afghanistan than you are to get in your automobile and drive down to the Dollar General store. Jim, if I can get on a personal basis with you, if you feel free to answer it. What was it like to aim that weapon at another human being? What what feelings did you have? The first couple of times, it was real hard to take someone else's life. But the more that they shot at you, you got thinking, well, if I don't shoot them first or don't return fire and, and, and kill them or wound them, that that's what they're trying to do to me. So you're, you're doing that to save yourself, save your friends, your buddies. And it's, it, it was hard, but it, it, it got easier. And it, it's not nothing that I'm proud about doing it. Uh, I was very lucky in Desert Storm. I was assigned with a unit, and I was in a rear area where I, I didn't have to deal with the upfront. 
I guess in some situations you could fire on the 